The third lecture is the chronic abdominal pain in children. And I'd like to invite Dr. Ahlam Abbas Sayyid Muslim. Uh, she's uh, the head of uh, pediatric gastroenterology, uh, hepatology, and nutrition in uh, Mubarak Hospital. Assalamu alaikum and sabah uh, al-khair. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, the organizing committee, Dr. Fahad. Uh, and Dr. Anawal for inviting me. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Chairman. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to uh, present at the Jahra Hospital uh, Conference. I congratulate you for this uh, beautiful uh, uh, talks and uh, such a marvelous uh, attendance. Uh, I was given the honor of presenting chronic abdominal pain and the talk was mostly um, uh, toward the clinical updates or the management updates. And um, the agenda is very simple. We'll talk a little bit about the characteristic of the chronic abdominal pain. Then we'll move on to differentiate functional uh, to uh, organic abdominal pain. And then we'll get into the meat of the talk. <coughs> so um, I would like first to introduce uh, the uh, concept of functional gastrointestinal disorders. These are usually a combination of chronic and recurrent uh, symptoms not explained by known biochemical or structural abnormality. They occupy about 50% of a pediatric gastroenterologist work and uh, can go up to 5% of the general pediatrician's uh, visits. And uh, the reason the, uh, these um, uh, uh, group of disorders are important is the number of hours that you spend with patients every week. They're discussing these disorders, their cost on the healthcare system, and the morbidity associated with it. Uh, patients have more somatic pain, functional impairment, and psychiatric disorders. And uh, the uh, uh, five-year follow-up uh, uh, shows quite uh, significant morbidity. Uh, it is very important uh, uh, to understand uh, the uh, literature when they compare these children to uh, children who have chronic disorders, uh, something like asthma. They actually do worse in terms of the day-to-day um, uh, -day, um, uh, living. So the ROM3 uh, classification already introduced to you by Dr. Fawaz uh, had incorporated the pediatric section in 2006. And uh, we have two, uh, uh, the last two actually of the ROM uh, 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 classification for pediatric. The first one is for infants and toddlers. And of course we are going to be talking about uh, the child and adolescents because that's where the chronic pain disorders would lie. And um, uh, under the childhood functional gastrointestinal disorders, there is the vomiting and erophagia. Uh, there is the constipation and incontinence, and of course, the abdominal pain-related uh, gastrointestinal disorders, and that's what we are talking about today. Under that um, uh, title, there is four different uh, subtitles, functional dyspepsia, irritable bowel syndrome, abdominal migraine, and children, uh, functional abdominal pain. Now, um, uh, it's better to sort of um, make it uh, in five slides and go through reading them, but that will waste your time and maybe someone will fall asleep. So I thought we'll just go through it together. If you think about all these disorders and uh, uh, unite them, the one common thing about them is they, there is always no evidence of inflammatory, anatomic, metabolic, or neoplastic process. Okay? And uh, all of these disorders, except one, um, have to present in such a way that the child have the symptoms uh, for at least twice a week in the last two months prior to you making the diagnosis. So which is the exception? I think you probably have figured it out. It's the abdominal migraine. And abdominal migraine, um, the difference in, 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 in um, uh, diagnosis is that you need to have the um, uh, episode of severe pain occurring at least twice a year prior to diagnosis. So quickly, to sort of just highlight what is functional dyspepsia, is mostly the child who comes to you with upper uh, abdominal pain. It's really uh, epigastric, uh, associated with um, uh, um, 
vomiting, heartburn, and, and, and uh, what have you. Uh, the irritable bowel syndrome is more uh, known in the adult. However, we are more uh, uh, encountering it these days. And this is where the abdominal pain is associated with chronic diarrhea or constipation, and they're overlapping. Sometimes the child is improved. Uh, when he passes tools, sometimes they are worse. Abdominal migraine is a little different. It has a very characteristic features of severe episodic pain. And those patients have other somatic symptoms, so photophobia, headaches, um, and they usually don't have so much of the diarrhea. Uh, the functional abdominal pain is the easiest. Whoever didn't fit any of the above criteria, you uh, sort of lump him there. And we call it a syndrome when there is comorbidities like missing school, um, uh, poor attendance to school, and um, uh, uh, other somatic symptoms. So how do we differentiate functional from organic causes? And that's the second part of the talk. Um, now, I'm not going to teach you about taking history. You all are excellent in doing that. And you know that when you take history, you can actually in your mind, in your office, uh, sort of um, uh, categorize a child whether these symptoms are chronic, uh, functional, or um, uh, organic. Now, what you probably are not aware of is that we don't have any uh, evaluation technique in the literature for whether our history is sufficient or not, or it can differentiate functional from organic. However, the two important uh, uh, points is that uh, you try to eliminate from your history or the red flags that could uh, uh, elude you toward a more serious organic disorder. So your initial evaluation would be more toward identifying the organic pathology and you screen for it. Uh, prior to testing, uh, you want to validate the symptoms for yourself and for your family. Red flags and red herrings, uh, uh, these are very important. Uh, if there is uh, uh, a history, uh, or family history of ulcers, inflammatory bowel disease, um, patients with positive unusual exams, patients um, who had started using narcotics for the pain, then you sort of started thinking uh, along with all the systemic signs and symptoms that you could encounter. Again, what is the productive, uh, and of course you would go about your tests and uh, you go from blood tests to more invasive uh, procedures, uh, but then there is nothing in the literature to tell you that um, there is this test that could differentiate organic from functional. And we are in the era of uh, biochemical uh, markers to identify certain diseases, NASH for example, in, uh, 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 acute liver failure. We're talking about this in the literature. However, this is a disease that we don't have that. So um, what about your ultrasound, uh, your endoscopy and biopsy, the pH monitoring? All of these, if you don't have red flags, really the benefits is, is, is down to minimal. And um, usually you predict, after you finish your clinical exam and history taking, you can predict that this child is probably going to be normal. And um, uh, whether you go all the way uh, to consulting a gastroenterologist and pushing for an endoscopy, or you just wrap it up with a uh, urine test to make sure there is a not, the, the child doesn't have a UTI and an ultrasound because it's not invasive. Um, uh, at the end, you come to a stage where all the studies are normal. So what do you do? I think you should have two goals. And you probably, um, uh, uh, your m most important one is relieving symptoms as they pressured most of the time with these families. But I think you also want these children going back to school and returning normal function. So uh, I think this is the slide that you probably should focus on more. Uh, everything I'm going to talk about more is uh, toward, um, let's say, um, possibilities of uh, reducing pain. Uh, you have to reassure the family. And the more time you spend with these families to explain the areology of pain, to reassure them that your child is actually normal, uh, the more reward you get. Sometimes they don't hear you the first visit. So the second visit, you repeat what you're saying, and that's OK. And sometimes they need to trust. Uh, some families come in, and they want an ultrasound. 
you know, and sometimes I'd say, okay, if you are not really going um, uh, uh, the extremes for someone who's absolutely uh, well, an ultrasound is not an invasive procedure, that's okay. And um, uh, I think uh, you all know about the reinforcing behaviors, and it's very well common in our cultures. Uh, every time a child is unwell and crying, falling to the floor, he gets the attention of the whole family, and I think that's so much rewarding. If I were getting that, I wouldn't stop doing it. So what do you think about the child? So what are the management um, modalities? So we'll start with the pharmacotherapies. And um, these are medications that we use, um, and people have been using them over the years, uh, 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 treating other disorders. So laxatives works really with child who comes in with an irritable bowel syndrome over constipation type mostly. Um, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, or pro, uh, and, and pro, hydrogen block, um, H2 blockers and uh, proton bomb uh, uh, inhibitors don't really benefit any child with functional dyspepsia. And uh, this is where you put a child on a trial um, and, and he comes back and the symptoms are worse. So immediately, I think this is where you sort of alert the family, okay, so if there was a disease, it should have been treated and it's not. Antismasmotic, again, use them uh, cautiously and, and you don't want a child who's coming uh, first time to the casualty with uh, a severe pain with no proper history and giving him antispasmotic to turn to be an acute abdomen. We've seen that. Now, the next category of medication uh, deals mostly with the brain-gut axis. So the idea is that the abdominal pain-related functional gastrointestinal disorders considered um, a, dis a state of dysregulation within the enteric and the central nervous system, resulting in alteration in sensation, motility, possibly in immune system. And um, out of all these drugs that you could use, um, the... Um, uh, uh, sedatives are probably um, sensible to use when you're talking about a child with um, uh, si underlying psychological or psychiatric problems. Uh, the antidepressants, along with their benefit of stabilizing mood, they do uh, improve in, uh, and, and they have anticholinergic side uh, uh, effect uh, to the uh, intestine and help uh, the gastrointestinal system. Uh, they restore uh, uh, sleep and uh, the oldest of all is the amitriptyline. Uh, and they've been used in migraine. I'm not talking abdom about abdominal migraine, but also regular migraine, and it helps. And there are studies to prove that. Um, uh, serotonin and 5-HT receptor antagonists, um, you know, with the recent uh, evidence that they, there is a, about 80% of serotonin in the gut, you would think that the use would be increased. However, the FDA had restricted it due to its complication of causing ischemia, uh, 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 and ischemia to, the, to the colon and, and perforation. So metastatin receptor agonist is again, you know, sort of um, uh, has a good concentration in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in the, in the gastrointestinal tract. And again, due to complications with its effect on hypoglycemia and um, uh, the gallbladder issues, it has been limited. All, and I call them anti-seizures because of the <laughs> limited stigma that we have around. People don't like calling epilepsy. Uh, so these medications haven't been used frequently because um, uh, I think off-label people tried them, but there's no evidence that they work. Five minutes. So, um, Psychological therapies, most importantly, is the cognitive behavioral therapy. And there is uh, so many studies to go through um, uh, uh, that went through the cognitive behavioral therapy. This is where a psychologist uh, is in order. They, uh, these are challenging. Uh, th uh, what they do is they change maladaptive pain behaviors. And this is the most useful, actually, of all the modalities that uh, we could discuss. There is so many uh, literature, the initial literature that came out, uh, had shown just um, uh, more pain-free times and the bigger study that came out um, uh, with more than 200 children showed really good results with reducing pain intensity. Actually, one of the studies showed if you gave cognitive behavioral therapy to the parents, the prognosis is really good. And probiotics, um, these are live microorganisms which are administered in adequate, if administered in adequate amounts, can confer 
health. We know that children uh, with uh, inflammatory, uh, sorry, uh, children with irritable bowel syndrome-like disorders have different microbiota than other children, and there are some literature that confirm that um, the benefit, and I mean, there are very small number if you look at them, and for all of these. Uh, however, um, uh, uh, and they're very limited. There are like six studies all over in the literature. But it is an idea, and people are more working toward research to do that. The FODMAP diet, this is the uh, 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 acronym for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, and monosaccharides, and polyols. And these the idea is to eliminate carbohydrates, certain carbohydrates that could cause uh, difficult absorption. So your fructose, your lactose, which is in milk, uh, fractan is actually a polymer of fructose, galactan is a polymer of um, galactose. And uh, the poly uh, polyols are the um, uh, artificial sweeter, and mostly, uh, and we're not talking about um, uh, the uh, protein types, we're talking about the xylol and all the ones that are used uh, uh, part to part as compared to granulated sugar. In adults, these are used quite, um, uh, 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 these uh, type of uh, uh, therapy has been used quite extensively. Very limited studies in children, however, the, um, um, the, uh, the, the most recent one that came out, small number uh, of children, but very, very uh, promising. Complementary therapy, I think what Dr. Mohammed talked about complementary therapy in Kuwait um, is not something that I'm going to show you here, but um, peppermint oil is probably one of the best um, that came out of the literature in terms of reducing pain and uh, hypnotherapy. Um, um, so in summary, chronic abdominal pain in children is not one condition. It is quite challenging and you need to consider the help of your gastroenterologist, your psychologist, and your dietitian. Uh, pharmacological interventions are the least, if uh, not null, sometimes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Halam, for this uh, comprehensive review. Now uh, we have time for two questions only, because of pressure of time. Dr. Gawabi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. So the colchicine part is, um, you know, uh, familial Mediterranean fever is a real disease, and uh, children do have pain, and that's not the category I'm talking about. So colchicine use for those patients has a basis to reduce inflammatory disorders. So that's not what I was talking about today at all. Um, the second question was more about the. Um, sorry, I missed out. <laughs> There's a the ultrasound. So um, I think, I think um, uh, uh, it's tempting to do ultrasound for these patients. And what I usually do is um, if the symptoms are quite relatively new and it's not chronic, so you didn't pass the two months, the child is actually way losing weight. Yeah, definitely. You want to make sure you're not losing out someone who has you know, lymphoma. But uh, these children uh, that we are presenting, they are very specific symptoms that comes up every time they're stressed, that comes up every time um, they need something and mom's not giving them. And uh, the pain is relatively um, uh, 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 vague, unlike children who usually turns to have organic causes. As far as the, um, the probiotics, um, uh, I'm not a big fan myself. I think uh, every time you do a change to your diet, your symptoms will improve in functional um, uh, gastrointestinal disorders. Um, however, uh, there is uh, um, building um, uh, data about what you're talking about, and it is true. So um, whether you advise your family to use the yogurt-added uh, 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 prebiotics, or you actually advise them to go and buy uh, uh, lactobacillus GG or VCL, um, uh, uh, they will feel better, definitely. The question is, how long are they going to use it, and how is the symptoms when they stop? That's very important. Other question? Yes, Dr. Satish. Thank you, Doctor, for this excellent presentation. My concern is, now we know that uh, behavioral therapy has got a lot of role in managing these patients. We seldom see that a lot of patients who come to the OPD sessions are not being referred to a psychologist either due to the lack of number of the child psychologist that is available. Do we have a plan to upgrade this? So, you pretty much touched on the pain, on the wound, right there. 
Um, in our hospitals, the ministry have done a great job filling us uh, with departments uh, of social workers with no psychologists. So our um, pediatric uh, departments are not attached with any psychology um, psychologist services. Um, it's a pain, and, and, and you cannot do it while you're in the hospital. Um, now, having said that, just uh, last Thursday, I met the first psychologist joining Mubarak Hospital, so I'm really excited uh, to sort of start working with her. And I don't know what's uh, the situation in other hospitals, Adan, Jahra, Farwani, I'm not really sure, um, but I think that's a step. Now, if you go um, uh, outside the ministry sort of boundary, there is a lot in the community to offer. And um, uh, it goes from um, uh, private uh, shrinks, I, I don't want to say shrink, uh, a private psychologist that you can actually go and hire and the family have to pay for it. And I don't know if there, uh, some insurances are paying for them or not. I don't know that either. And there is um, a special and unique service um, uh, that, um, if you help me, Dr. Fawaz, the um, there's this uh, service where they um, allow children and adults, anyone who needs psychological support um, to, the name is just, I'm running, it's, I'm, I'm losing it. Um, sure. They allow, you, 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 you give them a ring, you call, and you go there, and they don't take your name, they don't take your information. Uh, if you <laughs> <can> <laughs> <them>. <laughs> Perfect. So, and, and what they do is, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a unique service, and I've worked with a couple, uh, uh, of children who had really, really, really bad uh, irritable bowel syndrome like disorders and that sort of uh, dysfunctioned the whole family. I mean, parents were about to separate because of that. Uh, I've seen them there, and the nice thing, because you know, when you think about our culture, people don't want people knowing that you've went and seen a psychologist or a psychiatrist for that matter. And uh, they go there, they don't give a name, they don't give any information, they just talk about their problems and they get support that way. So that's what's available now, and I hope in the future we get more psychologists integrated in our department. Yeah, so I agree totally with Dr. Ahlam. I think functional GI disease is on the rise, and it is not the job of pediatrician or pediatric gastroenterologist alone. This is a multidisciplinary approach should be there to manage uh, these complex situations. Psychologists with a special interest in pediatric GI disease is warranted because uh, it, it's on the rise. Uh, not only abdominal pain, cyclic vomiting syndrome, abdominal migraine, migraine headaches, and so on. Uh, just to conclude the session, what's your intake on massage therapy, putting a hot pad yeah. on the abdomen, hypnotherapy, breathing exercise, and yeah. so on? So I actually had a big sec section on that. I took it out, and I'm glad I did, because then <laughs> there was not much time. I thought that you being chair, I'd get more time, but I didn't, so that's fine. Um, so uh, there is actually a great um, uh, uh, literature uh, a, a body of literature talking about hypnotherapy. And um, it is called imaginary training. So what it is, is you, they, they sort of, and, and I hear some psychologists do it. It's not the idea of, you know, you're lying on the bed and someone sort of put you to sleep. That's not what it is. That's rubbish. That's just for Tom and Jerry kind of movies and, and stuff like that. Um, what they do, they, they, they sort of, um, uh, uh, talk to the child and get them to imagine things and, 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 and take their mind far away from the pain. And there is a good body of literature, as I said, to support that. Now, relaxation and massage, outside of the context of cognitive behavioral therapy, they have not actually proven in the literature to support any. Now, um, when it comes to the kind of massage we usually recommend parents to do for children who have functional constipation and infants and you know just a, a massage the tummy and move the cycle the legs and stuff like that that's a little different that's more mechanical isn't it um, so I think um, uh, to answer your question yeah it's there and uh, if your family are buying into that they probably have gone there before they came to, they came to you so that's fine um, I'm not against it but but just give these families' realistic um, uh, uh, approach and, and reality of what's going on. I think the worst thing uh, that I've ever sa seen is the child who was referred um, with the idea that everybody is telling us you're lying and I have pain. The pain is genuine and it's there. 
and um, maybe one of you had it when you were a child, you just don't remember anymore. Uh, you, you need to acknowledge the pain, you need to reassure, and you need to uh, give them tools. You can't just talk and say, this is a functional pain, there's no disease, go figure out. You need to give them some tools. So whether you give them massage, hypnotherapy, cognitive therapy, you know, phone numbers, that's yes, good. And I agree with you completely. I think the lack point here is to educate teachers and school administration about this because there is a lot of lack of knowledge about this in public school and um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, children miss a lot of school because of this we have children they repeat the year they fail exams uh, so it's a very challenging problem for parents and for physicians uh, with this uh, i would like to conclude the session thank my co-chair dr maryam dr ahlam for the fascinating talk and all the speakers